Grace to you and peace from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Once again, we'll be going through this gospel account verse by verse from Matthew chapter 22. I've had the privilege in the last several years of being able to have wedding services in different venues. Obviously in the church in Santa Maria that I served in for a number of years. But also we had wedding ceremonies, Christian wedding ceremonies in ranches, in vineyards of course in that area, along Pismo Beach, and most recently I had the privilege of having a wedding service in January, Lake Tahoe, in a golf uh, course overlooking the lake as the snow was falling. But after each one of the wedding ceremonies that we had, we also had a wonderful feast, tremendously good food that was all part of the wedding reception. I could never imagine a situation where somebody would have a large wedding plan and invite all the guests and the people responded that they were coming and when the day of the wedding came, no one showed up. But that's exactly what Jesus tells us in this parable or story. The king has a wedding feast for his son. He invites all the people to come and in those days the wedding celebration would start before the wedding, maybe even a week, and everything is ready and he goes and tells people it's all ready for the wedding to start and no one shows up. This would never happen in ordinary life, but it happens every day in the kingdom of God. The message of the gospel goes out into the world and people turn up their noses at the wonderful blessing, the feast of all feasts to come to know about the forgiveness of sins and peace with God and eternal life. Jesus' heart was often broken, wasn't it? by the people that rejected his message and his invitation, just as your heart is often broken by the people you know and love who reject this wonderful invitation to come to the feast of all feasts. Well, now it's time to go back into our text and look more closely at our text. This feast is prepared especially for you. Jesus spoke to them again in parables saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who pre prepared a wedding banquet for his son. Notice it says that Jesus spoke in parables. He also spoke to them. And you ask yourself, who is the them he's talking about here, the Bible? If you look more closely at the words before this, you find out Jesus is in the last days, the last day, in fact, before he goes to the cross and suffers for us. He's in the temple courts teaching and preaching to people, and he's talking to the leaders of the Jewish people. And he talks to them in parables and stories so he can lead them to repentance and invite them to come to the feast of all feasts. Here's the story of a man who's a king. It says he gave a large wedding banquet for his son. As we said earlier, the custom in those days was the feast would start first and the wedding would come at the end of the feast. Now this is a king and this is the king's son that's getting married. Can you imagine the type of feast they must have had for the king's son? I don't want to make you hungry this morning because you're a little off on your schedule and you're probably already starting to get hungry, but I will anyway. Imagine the barbecue with the most wonderful tenderloin possible, not just some poor quality cut of meat. And it's all being carefully barbecued, similar to a Santa Maria style barbecue. And the bread, it's no ordinary bread. There's a wood-fired oven. And that wheat comes from the high plains of Colorado that's stressed up. That red Durham wheat, when you grind it, it has a fragrance. And when it's baked, it's unbelievable tasty bread. The fruit is all picked right at its perfection, ripeness as it comes from the tree. The vegetables are all fresh. The wine? The Cabernets have been sitting on the shelf for years and years, covered with dust. And when they're opened up, the fragrance fills the room. Such is the feast that Jesus is picturing for us. By the way, did you happen to see that also mentioned in the prophet Isaiah, the feast of all feasts? On this mountain the Lord will prepare a feast of rich food for all peoples, a banquet of aged wine and the best of meats and the finest of wines. And then it tells you in Isaiah that we read earlier what that feast was. It's when people come to the holy mountain of God the place where Jesus died and gave his life and rose again from the dead. 
so we could have eternal life through him. It says, on this mountain he will destroy the shroud that enfolds all people, the sheet that covers all nations, and he will swallow up death forever. I didn't have this in my original sermon. My wife always said, be careful not to add things to the sermon you're preaching, but I'm going to anyway this morning. Because the word in both the Hebrew and the Greek for swallow up has a, is this intensified word. It's not just swallowing something. It's just gulping it down and swallowing it completely. And that's what happened to death. That's why it's the feast of all feasts and why we read this portion of scripture often on Easter morning as we celebrate the bodily resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. So what's the kingdom of God like? It's like the feast of all feasts, where people come and taste the best food they've ever tasted. It's coming to God's holy mountain, where they know their sins are forgiven, and they have peace with God and eternal life through him. It's coming to this wonderful feast where Jesus himself gives us his very body and blood in the holy sacrament for the forgiveness of our sins. There's nothing I can do to save myself. And on this holy mountain, and you know your sins and I know mine, and on this holy mountain we have the feast of all feasts, peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, we need to get back into our text because there's so much more that we need to look at this morning. Now that the feast has been prepared, and that's a wonderful picture of salvation where God does everything for us and prepares our salvation for us. He says, he sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come to the feast. How shocked we are when the invitation goes out, what is their response? It says, he heard these people did not want to come and does he give up? No. What does it say? He sent more of his servants to tell them, to say, tell those who have been invited that I prepared my dinner, my oxen and fattened calf have been butchered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. Here, everything is prepared. You think of how God so carefully prepared your salvation for you. When my daughter was married, I can't tell you how many hours we spent in preparation. And then everything has to be carried out specifically on the wedding day. Well, think of your God. He so carefully prepared your salvation through his son. Everything is meticulously carried out. And now the invitation goes out to come to the feast. And they reject and come up with all sorts of excuses. It's obvious the point that Jesus is making here this morning, isn't it? That these people just don't had to just say they didn't they had happened to forget about it they willfully they wanted nothing to do with that feast they would not have anything to do with jesus and his blessings so did the religious leaders get the point that jesus was making he was talking about them and their rejection of him and his kingdom if you were to look at the verses previous to this in matthew 21 it says, when the chief priests and the Pharisees heard Jesus' parables, they knew he was talking about them. They wanted nothing to do with this feast where God prepares everything for us. They wanted to think we can do something to save ourselves, as most people believe today. Think of the words of John 3, 16, the wonderful invitation that goes out to the feast of all feasts. God so loved the world he gave his only begotten son. Whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And yet when you share that simple message of the gospel with people, they really don't want to listen to what you have to say. They'd rather go on with their own life and sometimes violently, vociferously, vigorously, vehemently reject this simple message of the gospel. That's what Jesus said only a couple of verses after John 3, 16, when he said, this is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but men love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Let's get down to this congregation. Many of you sitting here have personally felt a deep loss on some of the people you've come to know and love over the years, no longer care about coming to the feast. And I look up and down our own neighborhood, and many times we remark, no one goes to worship on Sunday morning. 
People don't want to come to the feast. They reject the feast. And yet, what does the king want? The king isn't going to be content to have no one show up for the wedding feast of his son. So he sends his servants out, and they go out into the highways and the byways to find people to bring into the feast. He tells them, go out into the street corners and invite to the banquet anyone you find. The street corners almost implies these intersections that take place. And who hangs around in the intersections? We know in California, the homeless people love to hang around in the intersections where they can perhaps reach out and get a handout. It was no different then. He sends them out into the street corners and invites them to come in. And it didn't make any difference who they were. It says, anyone you find. That means young and old, poor, people's lives who are messed up. It makes no difference. They're invited to come into the feast. That's the way it is in the kingdom of God. You think of how often people come to the feast who certainly didn't deserve to come to this feast, such as the Apostle Paul who said, although I'm less than the least of all God's people, this grace was given to me. Do you ever feel like you're chief of sinners? As we sing in one of our hymns, as Paul said of himself, why do we say that? Because you don't know my heart, but I know my heart. I know my heart. And I know there's nothing I can offer God to possibly come to this feast and earn the salvation he has for me. And yet he found me when I was lost. Found me on that street corner. Brought the invitation to me and to you. Come to the feast of all feasts. It's going to happen in the last days in which we live. The king isn't just going to sit by and let his banquet hall be empty. He's going to send his servants out into the world. And if it should happen that the cathedrals of Europe are empty with only a handful of people in these large cathedrals on a Sunday morning, the king is going to send his servants out to places like Africa and India and other parts of the world and bring the people in so his banquet hall can be filled. That's the way the king is. Even Jesus was that way, wasn't he? When they were mocking him and wagging their heads at him as he was dying on the cross and turning their hearts against him, rejecting his invitation to come to the feast, a dying thief turned to him and said, What? Lord Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, Today you're going to be with me in paradise. As we sing in the hymn, the dying thief rejoiced to see that fountain in this day, there of eyes vile as he washed all my sins away. You know what Martin Luther's dying words were, 1546, his final words that he spoke as his confessor, Jonas Bugenhagen, was there with him. His final words were, beggars are we all, that's for sure. And the beggars have been brought this wonderful feast of all feasts. And the Lord has brought that to you in your life. Well, we need to go back into our text, as we said we would. So uh, we see something developing different in this story that Jesus tells. The king is delighted to see that his banquet hall is filled finally with guests. But then something strange meets his eye. It says, when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing wedding clothes. Brandy asked, how did you get here? And then it says, that man was speechless. You see, this man was no boorish buffoon who enjoyed crashing weddings. This man wasn't some person who had way too much to drink in the bar and said, you know, I see a wedding going on over there. And he became a wedding crasher to go into the wedding and and sit down and get some food to eat and maybe even some more good wine to drink. This man was speechless because he purposely, willfully, did not want to accept the wedding clothes that the king wanted to give him for this wedding feast. You see, because Jesus tells a parable that allows us to imagine what it must have been like for these poor beggars on the street to be invited to this king's wedding, the son of the king, the first thing they would ask is, well, what am I going to wear? The king solved that problem. He made sure they had a shower. He made sure their hair was cut. And then he gave them the wedding clothes. 
mind you, not just clothes you might pick up at the thrift store or Walmart, but Versace gowns, Gucci shoes, Briani suits. Nothing was too good to be worn for the wedding feast. And he didn't want that. This is really telling the Jewish leaders that they were the people who don't want the wedding clothes for the wedding supper of the Lamb. Because these people believed they could wrap themselves in their own goodness, their own robes of righteousness. And you know what the Bible says of the rags of our righteousness. They're nothing but filthy rags in the sight of God. And here you sit, wonderfully clothed. The invitation has come to you to come to the feast. And you now have these beautiful wedding clothes. You wear the righteousness of your Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not exaggerating. Because in the Revelation of John it says, Then one of the elders asked me, These in white robes, who are they? And where did they come from? And then he said, These are they who washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. You've been baptized in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And what did your baptism give you? Read Galatians chapter 3, and it says, As many have been baptized in Christ, have clothed yourself with Christ. And here you sit, celebrating the feast of all feasts with the wedding clothes that Lamb has given you. Come to the feast. Come to the feast. Jesus says in our text, Many are called, but few are chosen. The invitation is going out into all the world. And you're sitting here this morning not because you've made the right decisions in your life. You are sitting here because God has chosen from all eternity to give you the gift to believe in the wedding clothes that he has provided for you and to believe this is the feast of all feasts. Come again this morning to the feast. Come to take the very body and blood of your Lord Jesus. And then jump for joy because of the feast that he's given to you. This feast begins now. It's celebrating the goodness of your God, rejoicing in his unfailing love, and it continues all your life. And yes, it's with you as a congregation. Every time you worship, even though you're going through a time of vacancy, you have temporary pastors, and we're so thankful to the Lord you have now called a pastor who's answered this call for you. But as you wait for him to come, this is a time week by week to encourage each other and say we're going up to the wedding feast of the Lamb. Let's enjoy that feast together and someday we'll feast together in the place the Lord has prepared for us. Come to the feast. Amen.